Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. That's the Cycling Coach Podcast presented by Trainer Road. Today, we're going to cover how to regain fitness quickly. A lot of folks writing in recently that they've been sick or they're just coming back from not training for a while. We're going to cover that. We're also going to talk about quite a few other things like, for example, breathing. We're also going to talk about what would, what Nate would do if he went back into training full time and he's with us today. It's going to be fun. Uh, let's kick it off with Corinne's question. She says, I almost didn't use my actual name for this because it's so embarrassing, but I don't know how to breathe during a workout. Don't worry. Yeah, you're not alone in this one, Corinne. <laughs> uh, I've been told in through the nose and out through the mouth and deep breaths my whole life, but in the middle of a VO2, inter VO2 interval, all that's about as useful as a flat tire. So anytime I focus on my breathing, I feel like it gets more out of control and I'm afraid it's hurting my training. Do you have any tips for breathing exercises I can try? Uh, Chad, we covered, uh, breathing in like you went, you did a full deep dive on breathing in episode 294 of the ask a cycling coach podcast. So everybody bookmark that one and you can go listen to that. I figured this would be a good practical discussion, uh, on, on breathing. Uh, like Chad, it. do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I, I do have a number of things that, that come to mind. So I hope that over the course of this, we can kick it back and forth and, and, and some of the things we talk about will spur my memory and help me cover everything because I'm flying notes free today. So I'll interrupt you, Chad. <laughs> good, good do because it'll give me time to <laughs> ponder and, and try to dredge up some of the stuff that I may otherwise forget. Uh, first off, it is understandable that you get a little in your head when it comes to breathing, because there's a lot of information that tells us we're breathing wrong, that we uh, can breathe better, that we can enhance performance by breathing a particular way. There's stuff that links it to physiological uh, adaptations and therefore potentially performance improvements that are uh, iffy at best. Uh, I should preface all this by saying that, I mean, I've, I've read four books dedicated specifically to breathing, entire books, and, and each of them within them, they'll say something and I'll be like, ah, that can't be right. Or, oh, is that, is that real? And then I'll hit the, the research citations. And sometimes they're tied to research. Sometimes they're tied to blog posts. Sometimes they're tied to a product that's being sold. So it's, it's super hit or miss uh, of the four books that I've read and the two that I have locked and loaded, which are super low on the list of priorities because the first four still haven't yielded anything. And, and I do keep kind of a, a keen eye on on what emerges. If it mentions something tied to breathing, tied to, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like no more than to find that there is something there so that we can say, oh, here, here's something else that can also improve your performance. And it's as simple as improving the way you breathe, but that's just not the case so far. So, so the research behind all of this is optimistic. I mean, these people want to believe that this is going to make an impact, but what they've provided or what the research has demonstrated doesn't, doesn't back that up super well just yet. So uh, I, I read what you're saying. And the first thing that comes to mind is that you are simply getting in your head. You're, you feel like you're doing something wrong and that just kind of perpetuates this cycle that, that gets, makes an already stressful situation a little more stressful and training is stressful. And when you're pushing that hard and you move into those, those more intense exercise domains, it's, it's a little scary. It's, it's often uncomfortable. I mean, there are times where I'll do an interval so hard that I wonder am I going to come back from that? And then I have to do it again and again and again. And each time it gets a little more frightening. I mean, overt, uh, outwardly frightening. So it's it's understandable that you get a little hung up on, am I breathing right? Hey, Chad, Can I do this better so I don't hurt quite so much? On a VO2 max interval, isn't the point to get to that maximum breathing rate? Like, Yeah, it can be. I mean, maximum, it, it, maximum it, oxygen uptake. Like, So you have to breathe hard. And also, maybe, the, not through the nose. Is, that's, can you cover that too? Isn't that limiting? Yeah. So, I mean, we're not even trying to necessarily hit VO2 max. I mean, even when we do anaerobic repeats, we're trying to, we might touch VO2 max, but we don't want to sit at VO2 max. It's not a terribly productive place to train relative to the toll it takes on the body. So we want to work at high percentages of VO2 max and 90% and of VO2 max is a plenty uncomfortable place to, to spend time. And you can accumulate a fair amount of time, send a stronger signal and therefore, you know, reap a, a stronger response, better adaptive response. So, but yeah, we do have to put ourselves in a position that is uncomfortably high when it comes to our respiration rate and our ventilation rate, I should say. But honestly, if, if focusing on anything helps you breathe better, and that's always my intent when I offer instructions on how to improve your breathing with the on-screen instructions, it's simply to, for one, to, to offer some productive distraction just to keep you off of the fact that I hate everything that's going on right now. So here's something that I can focus on that maybe distracts me, but also helps me 
calm things down. And, and that really is the objective behind most of my breathing instructions is to calm people down because what's being described here by Corinne is exactly what can happen. I mean, there's so many different stress responses. And if we're already working hard, it's hurting, it's get a little, getting a little progressively scarier, especially as you see, maybe I have still a minute or 90 seconds left and you do start focusing on that breathing. Maybe that's the thing that draws you away from your, your, your misery and helps you slow your breathing a bit, focus on using your more, uh, your, your diaphragm, your more uh, inspiratory or just ventilatory related muscles. Anything that, again, provides productive distraction is the intention there. doesn't matter if it's through your mouth. Okay, and to your question, Nate, it, it does matter whether you breathe in through the nose or in through the mouth in terms of certain things. So it warms the air better if it's nasal inspiration. It, it, it clears the air or cleans the air a little bit better before it reaches your lungs. It produces a higher level. What if I trim my level. nose hair? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. It no, no, produces it a higher matter, level. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Produces a higher level of nitric oxide when you nasally breathe. You still get it when you orally breathe or when you nasal orally breathe if you're combining the two. But that nitric oxide, you know, it benefits the, the endothelial function. So your blood vessels are you know, function at a slightly higher level and maybe that enhances performance. I, but but that, that should be the question. I mean, don't get so hung up on I need to increase my nitric oxide inhalation so that I can perform better because that link has not been made. And if it has been made, it's tenuous at best. So these are the things, and to, to my, over, my overarching point is there's a lot of information, there's a lot of room for confusion, there's a lot of uh, seeds of doubt that are easily planted, but I'm not sure there's a lot of science to back all these things up. In fact, I'm quite sure there isn't a lot of science to back these things up. Mm -hmm. I mean, and from a headspace perspective of any application to training when something is difficult, Corinne is focusing on and getting more and more out of control. Like if you apply that to anything within training, like your legs hurting and fixate on what's going wrong and totally. fixate on how to address it rather than, um, you know, kind of distracting yourself in, in some of those or, you know, applying some tools to redirect. If you just fixate on how bad it's going, do you just spiral? I feel like I absolutely spiral. Like if my mm -hmm. legs hurt and I oh, fixate yeah, on how much I hurt and um, what interval is coming next. And that's kind of why I like training with power so much is I almost don't have to think about the RPE or, um, you know, the intervals that are coming, just make lines smooth, make number, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> I don't, I don't have to think about what the effort necessarily feels like, or if it's going wrong and how to correct it. Um, so I feel, I wonder how significant Corinne's breathing problem is or if it's just fixating on what's going wrong and that's making them spiral, you know? I actually, so, so when I first met my wife, I remember we were doing something and she, Corinne admitted to me, she said, I'm so embarrassed to admit this, but I don't know how to breathe. Uh, we were on like a really strenuous hike. And I was like, you actually do know how to breathe because you're alive. Um, is what I told her. <laughs> I was like, so great job. You're actually really, really good at it. Um, and, and this is Corinne, uh, you sound like me in the sense that you like, we like to, and I'm sure a lot of people listen to this. We like to think about all the details and break down the best way to do something and find the best way to do something. And in terms of breathing, there's uh, Chad, you mentioned this last week when we talked about VO2 max. There's a whole lot of things, and you talk about the funnel that goes down to getting oxygen to your muscles mm -hmm. so that they can work yeah, let's well. Yeah, touch on that. There are so many different like steps that and and bottlenecks or gates that are wide open as yeah. it, as it gets down to your muscles, <clears throat> and and in most cases, and granted, I know there are exceptions, but in most cases, the 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 bottleneck doesn't start with like your the problem is you're breathing through your mouth and not your nose, right? <laughs> Yeah, and this is maybe one opportunity to allay Corinne's fears a bit and maybe get her out of her head a little bit and just help her breathe naturally and not overthink it, that when it comes to performance limitations, at least in terms of aerobic capacity and aerobic uh, uptake and uh, VO2 and uh, basically what maybe she thinks is hindering her performance in the moment, the bottlenecks that, that we talked about are primarily – seem to be centrally regulated. So, or not even central, central yeah, centrally regulated. So if, if let, let's just start with the heart. So the left ventricle has to pump as much blood as it can. That that's, that's pretty much the primary bottleneck beyond that. It's what the blood, you know, the blood that that ventricle is pushing into the system. How much oxygen is it 
carrying, how much oxyhemoglobin or hemoglobin is present. And then as we move down the line through the blood vessels, how healthy or how, or how uh, elastic are the blood vessels? How resistant are they? How high, high, high is the blood pressure, et cetera? Then when it gets to the muscles, how much of the oxygen does it offload? That doesn't seem to be a real issue. What does though is how much can it pick up and utilize? Uh, all of these things are verifiable limitations, whereas the, the pulmonary aspect of it, what our lungs can get into the blood to push them out of the heart are not, is not, not unless there is some sort of underlying issue, some, some form of bronchoconstriction, whether it's tied to cold weather or, or, you know, breathing disorder, um, God forbid something as severe as COPD, but it, it, unless the lungs are unhealthy, it's, they're probably not the limitation. And there is some, some, uh, pretty, robust, I guess, uh, relatively research that says that the inspiratory <laughs> muscle training can Sorry. enhance Sorry. performance. I mean, robust, in these two things, this is, <laughs> this is, yeah, I, uh, I, I kind of want to walk That's that back a little bit because I don't want people thinking that you can, you can buy into this wholeheartedly, sure. but the, the, the research on inspiratory muscle training is promising, but it does assume first off that you have uh, an inspiratory muscle training, uh, bottleneck, you know, some, some form of uh, low fruit that you can work on and maybe improve this. And honestly, it might be one of the things I would recommend because the solutions are pretty inexpensive. They're pretty simple. They don't take a lot of time and there's not really any harm to be done. I mean, if nothing else in Corinne's case, maybe it will help her relax a bit and think, well, I've been doing this inspiratory muscle training, so it can't be my inspiratory muscles because that function has improved. Placebo. It, it, yep, exactly. Or, or there could be something literal there. Maybe you did have a limitation there. Maybe your inspiratory muscles were flagging and they weren't keeping up with the other systems in the body and some small uptick in their function does help you perform better. But again, it's one of those things that it's tough to say, I started doing IMT training for short and now I perform better. It must've been the IMT training because chances are you're doing a lot of things, maybe not even differently, but you're just training consistently. And that could be yielding all the benefits that you want to misappropriately uh, uh, or give credit to uh, when it comes to the inspiratory muscle training. But I, I don't know. I've got one. I do plan to start using it at some point just because it's interesting. Um, I, but I don't know how I'm going to be able to defensively say it was the IMT device that helped me ride better this season. You can take up tuba also. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anything that's, that strengthens those muscles, right? Why not? Can I, I point out an overarching theme here? surrounding VO2 max intervals and trying to attribute something that goes wrong as a result of how <laughs> riders feel during VO2 max intervals. I feel like it's kind of constant. It's like mm -hmm. my FTP is wrong. Mm. I have this, I have a back problem. Uh, my heart rate, this and that VO2 max, um, can't breathe during VO2 max. Like there's so much something about, well, we know what the thing about VO2 max intervals is that makes people feel that way, but <laughs> that's always the type of workout that makes Athletes want to attribute like what's going wrong. Something is wrong because this workout feels this way and doesn't feel like just feels bad. At what, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's probably just like, that simple. <laughs> That's such a good point, Ivy. And I, the, the mental state that I do the best in VO2 max workouts, either in that fight or flight, the flight is something's wrong. My trainer's not calibrated this. I'm not breathing. Right. And then I can get in this like state where it's a fight state. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm in a street fight right now. I'm going to be on top of this thing. You feel like you're on top of the interval and you're like, I'm going to gut through it and I'm just going to make it through this thing. And when you can lock, you can settle into that state that it's almost like you don't even think about your breathing. You're just like almost angry at the interval and you're like, I'm going to beat you. Yeah. And that's the, those are the best workouts. Uh, right. What Chad said about the, about not absorb. Well, so if you do a VO two max test, with an actual, like at a science, at a science place, uh, where they, <laughs> they put something over your mouth. place where they do science. <laughs> yeah. That's where that, that is. That's actually where they do science. When you put it over your mouth and, uh, it tracks how much air you breathe in. And that's like the, the tidal volume. And what you can see on screen is they can also measure based on what you ex, um, exhale, how much oxygen you're absorbing. And what you'll see is at a certain point, you won't absorb any more oxygen, although your tidal volume keeps increasing because you, your body's like, I need more oxygen, I'm gonna die. And it keeps, um, you keep taking more and more breaths, but it's not the limiter. Like the amount of air you get into your lungs isn't the limiter, it's how much air your your lungs could, or oxygen your lungs can absorb. And that's, that's what Chad was saying inside of that. And if you're not, um, if the, so if you had a test and let's say it, it did flatline or it, it, there was correlated together where your 
the oxygen absorbed and the amount of um, your tidal volume was in line and it never plateaued, I would be like, yeah, sure. Maybe you're going to want to strengthen those muscles so you can breathe a little, a little bit more. But if it flatlines, then mm-hmm. it's, that's obviously not the limiter. Um, the other one on this about the, the breathe through your nose and out through your mouth, as someone with sinus issues, this is such, this messed with <laughs> me for so, so long. We all don't get the same, we don't have the same like size Whoa. straws to breathe in. I remember when I was uh, a triathlete, people would be, it's like a old wisdom, right? Usually an old guy would be like, you gotta be able to breathe through your nose the whole time when you run or else you're running too hard. And uh, I had uh, deviated septum and huge terminates and allergies. And that was impossible. I think just sitting on my desk, I had to breathe through my mouth. So the, the, there's no like, there's no interval or like um, level of power output that requires, that is only valid if you use breathe through your nose. So I would just forget all of that. Just breathe how you want to breathe. And yeah, that, breathe how you want to breathe. Like your body will take care of itself. One personal tip that I use when I feel like my breathing is getting out of control, <clears throat> that number one, if it is a VO2 max interval, and that's kind of the goal is to go that hard, I don't care about it. I just, like Ivy said, I make power, I make power graph go flat, right? And <laughs> I, like, I just hold target. Uh, but if it's a situation where I do feel like, man, I don't think I should be uh, breathing this hard right now. I focus on something that Chad gives us directions on in the workout text. A lot of the time is on, instead of focusing on inhaling, I focus on exhaling and it, in really what that does in most cases is that's going to offload more CO2 or perhaps do it a more effective job of offloading CO2. That's the intent behind it. But what I found is that it just stops me from focusing on the inhaling part. Cause when I'm focusing on just inhaling more and more and more, it never feels like it's enough. But on the exhaling part, I can push out and I can be like, oh, good. I just did a great job exhaling. I just did a great job. And it stops me from hyper-focusing on that inhaling part. I think it's actually more effective in, in that regard than it is probably at offloading CO2. I don't know. Yeah, and that is the, that's the objective of, of, of increased respiration. I mean, that is why we breathe harder is to clear CO2. It's not to take in more oxygen. It's to get rid of the CO2 because it's the CO2 that's tied to the increase in the the acidity that's taking place across numerous systems. It's 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 the it's what motivates that almost well distinctly fear response. I mean, you you, you put people there been experiments where they'll uh, put people in masks and expose them to greater CO two. So no matter how hard they breathe out, they 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 get less they get rid of less CO two, and it creates severe panic. And it doesn't take long to do it. You hear people that's recount cool. experiences of doing this thing for experimental research. And it sounds downright terrifying. Nothing this I'll ever. This is no called swimming, me. actually, for me. This is swimming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, to a degree. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, that connection sure. could be made, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Nate, I want to ask a question for, uh, so you mentioned the fact that it was difficult for you to breathe through the nose, everything else. Did you end up using anything like breathe right strips or anything that you felt like helped, uh, with that? Or did you feel like it was the, (laughs) yeah, the devices themselves didn't make a big difference. The breathe right. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, it it didn't open enough the breathe right strips and because of my turbinates, um, they were so big and they were inflamed and I had like polyps on it. There was a physical limitation that any of those strips would not work. Uh, Afrin d- did help, but Afrin is a very, like, it's a tricky Oof. drug because when you do it for multiple days, it makes it worse. You get a rebound effect. And mm-hmm. I've only, I only use it if it's mm, like, like one, one time, if there's something really bad going on and I need to, uh, to open up my, my airways for yeah. a limited time. But this, Jonathan's suggestion was a good one and it's actually my suggestion. So. Yeah, for me, but it, it, if you focus on <laughs> something, on the back there, <laughs> focus on clearing the air. I, I think that I think that that might be enough of a distraction for Corinne to just to just get over it. So rather than panic about her breathing, just think about forcefully clearing the air, getting rid of the stuff that's causing the panicky sensation in the first place. And that might be that might be the one simple simple trick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ivy, do you have anything else to add? I don't know if you have any sort of like tricks with breathing when, cause I mean, cyclocross, uh, so when I do cyclocross, I don't do it as good as pros and it just feels like panic breathing uh, many times, like the whole entire race. So, yeah, well, and I didn't want to invalidate Crin by saying that it's okay if you breathe differently or at a quicker rate or heavier than other people. But that's honestly what I notice in racing across disciplines is that there are very fit, uh, capable, experienced athletes that just breathe louder or at a quicker pace or differently than other riders. It seems very individualized. And I think, you know, that's a little bit what Nate is speaking to 
right? Everyone's different. Um, some folks can breathe. No one is, no one looks like their mouth closed, nose breathing during cycle cross though. But, um, they're very distinctly different riders that some are, um, just making a lot of noise and breathing really loudly while others are pretty chill and they might be really close in fitness level and close to exuding the same effort and they just breathe differently. <laughs> this is reminding me of that. Have you guys seen that book? Everybody poops. Uh, that <laughs> like you breathe with kids or <laughs> everybody <laughs> I mean, breathes <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean even like that we all just breathe differently it's fine yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome hopefully that was helpful let's get into Mark's question um, actually if you're listening to this right now and you haven't rated the podcast on Spotify we are the number one rated po- cycling podcast on Spotify yes and on iTunes fantastic yes. Keep it going and share the podcast with your friends. If you're listening to this right now, it would mean the world to us if you just hit the little share button and then shared it with some of your friends. So please do that. Uh, Mark's question, this one's targeted toward Nate, but it's going to be applicable to all of us in some way too. Mark says, love the podcast and all trainer road does to make me faster. AI FTP detection is a game changer. And that feature is still in beta. If you want to get access to it, go to your trainer road. It'll sign up for trainer road. First of all, Uh, you got to do it and then go over Mm -hmm. there to your accounts and you can go click on something called early access and enable AI FTP detection because it's still in beta. So we're constantly improving it. He says it's a game changer for this chronic. And he says in quotes over tester and my training has never been better. This is what we love to see. Uh, in fact, Nate and I were just talking about in a separate meeting prior to this, we were just talking about situations and people at first when AI FTP detection was just available via beta, they'd send us messages on Instagram and they'd be like, that's ridiculous. Like I can't do that or that's way too low or the whatever AFT, it yeah, might be. The FTP predicted FTP is wrong. Yeah, exactly. And then we would say like, try a few workouts and let us know how it goes. And afterward they're like, Oh my gosh, it's perfect. It was right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It turns out it was right. So it's helping Mark as well. Mark says, my question is mostly, mostly targeted toward Nate, but the rest may have some input. I'm six foot six inches. That's 198 centimeters and 210 pounds or 95 kilograms, which I think is close to Nate's measurements. And then he says in parentheses here, not sure if I've heard them mentioned. Uh, yeah, I think we've mentioned Nate's height a few times. (laughs) I raced criteriums and road races for the better part of 10 years during and after college, but haven't raced in the last 10 years. I'm in a spot in life where I have more free time than I used to. And I want to get back into road racing. I used to be 180 pounds and built like a flagpole, but years of lifting weights and minimal cardio now has me with a muscular build. If Nate were to get back into racing right now, what sort of dietary and lifestyle changes would he make? Would he do, or, and then what would he do for his training? Would he race differently in the past now that he's hashtag Nate jacked? (laughs) I'm clearly (laughs) asking for all all of this for a friend, (laughs) he says, and appreciate any and all input. Thank you. Wait, is this Nate? Nate, are you Mark? Did you write this? Did you send I'm this asking in? myself the question. Are you asking how you would get back into training? <laughs> it is remarkably similar uh, to, to you for sure. Nate, this is this is yours. I, I pitch it to you. What would you do if you were to get back into training right now to yeah. try to get back into it? So when Mark was, uh, he's 6'6 six, six and one, 198. And when he was 180, that is uh, 81 and a half kilos. So Slim. And that's what I did Leadville at was, was that, you know, look back at those pictures, you know, there's a 20 pound difference. Uh, what is that? Like a 14 pound or 14 kilo difference. It's, yeah. it's pretty big. And what I would do is when you were, when I was 180 and I was lighter or even in like, I think when I was racing really well too, I was below 190. I could get away on some Hills, especially a short Hill, the longer Hills, you know, some of the lighter cat two people would draw me. But if I came back right now, I'm 200 pounds, which is like, I don't know, 90, 90, 92 kilos, kilos, something like that. I would flat races. That's it. Like no more (laughs) hills ever again. And also nothing that has a, um, a, uh, like hot dog that has a start, like a stop then an acceleration. Because when you're that heavy, it is totally hard. If it's like sweeping turns, like a four corner crit, man, you can roll and you can hide and you just keep rolling and rolling and rolling. And you would, you know, you always have to look up the field. Pete's we have this in so many videos, but you look ahead and when they start accelerating ahead, you're starting to also accelerate so that there's not so much of a yo-yo effect depending on where you're at. Um, and that can help with, you know, um, tail, tail gunning and a whole bunch of racing. We've talked about many, many times. I think for the way I would, I would ride, I would also just ride the same way of, I would focus on that anaerobic power even more and that one minute power. And I still, I hope I know how to sprint now. Um, but I don't, I would, I would practice that too, but really that one minute power and do a whole bunch of, uh, anaerobic 
train road workouts that are around a minute and some on offs at first and then get more um, specialized in it and just try to go for those those bombs at the end where you're in a breakaway and people are looking at each other or you can catch people off guard when it's strung out early on. I think, John, you know, there's a video of me winning on uh, going into a headwind because if you make that gap into a headwind, the next person, especially if it's your teammate, that's the best. If they block, everyone else then has to then overcome the wind and catch you, which is, you know, because uh, it's exponential with wind resistance. It's even more. And if you can get a, a little bit of a gap and you can keep it for a minute, that's really good. If there's a team behind you and they rotate, you're screwed. That's so a, <laughs> that's from about a practical it. standpoint, you would just pick train now attacking just every single day, just forever. It's every day. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then for nutrition, I mean, it, it would just be, I would up my calorie intake and it would probably be mostly carbs because I'm hitting my uh, two grams per kilogram of um, protein. Uh, protein per, yeah. Um, every day. And then I am, my fat is good and I'm doing, you know, nuts and fish and um, healthy fats like that, avocado oil. And then, yeah, the, the real variable of that would be my carb intake or, um, before, during, and after mostly before and during though, my, uh, my, my rides. Cause that's the, you know, if I burn an extra 2000 calories a day, most of that's going to be carbs. If I'm hitting my two grams per kilogram of, of, uh, protein, and then I'm hitting my fat, that's, that's the variable. It seems like what Mark is handing out here is like, <clears throat> Nate, what would you do to like, you know, shift your body composition and return to that? And, but you're, what you're saying here is that you wouldn't focus as much on that as you would focus on performance. Is that an accurate way of representing what you're saying? My body count is actually better than when I was cycling. Uh, in terms of like, uh, you're saying in terms of body composition. Yeah. It's like body fat. Mass. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm leaner and because I have more muscle too, my body fat percentage is lower. That's one thing too that we don't realize is that when you have a whole bunch more muscle, you can have the same amount of fat and your body percent is lower because you're yeah, yeah. You weigh more because you have more muscle. So when you compare yourself to someone who's like pure muscle and they have the same body fat and you're like, man, I look actually thinner than them. It's, it's because they weigh more. Uh, sure. If you, you know, just add 30 pounds to the denominator, that that's what, what happens. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't focus on body comp at all. I think it's your point, John, it's your team. Yeah. For is yeah, just do the power. Right. And I, right now I have no aerobic fitness, so it would be a lot of getting the aerobic base up, um, through, you know, sweet spot training. I don't have time to do, you know, a whole bunch of long, um, slow distance rides. So sweet spot training threshold stuff. And I need that because in order to get to that one minute power, I gotta be fresh. I gotta not be dropped and I gotta be relatively fresh, um, to be able to put out that one minute power. It's not just all about that one minute power. So IV, I can't do attacking every single day. <laughs> I will, I will and I, be there I, the race. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's true. You, you can have a great woman of power, but if you're not there at the end of the race in a spot where you can actually use that to win, who cares? Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and what Ivy's talking about is train. Now you should sign up for train road and use it. It's awesome. Uh, if you don't have a plan and if you don't have like a specific goal that you're working for, and you don't want to stick to the structure of a plan train now can just give you an appropriate workout for the day that you're doing. And it's also cool because it takes into context context. If Nate was trying to do attacking every day, it would stop. It would recommend that he not do that. <laughs> so <laughs> it would recommend that he switch it up and do other things. Uh, it's a super cool feature, really popular with folks that aren't on a training plan. Chad, I want to pivot this a bit, and this is for all of us really, but the concept of like, how do I regain fitness? So first I want to cover the illness situation where somebody is sick and coming back from training. Uh, well, and how do I get back fast? Because that, <clears throat> that induces like a panic in us, right, Chad, where it's like, yeah. shoot, how if do we I can, get it back? I do want to talk about that. Can we backtrack just a bit? Because I like sure. that Nate, he took an approach that I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking along those lines of maintaining the body composition he has right now and figuring out how to race well built as that type of an athlete and everything he said, yeah, that, that all pencils. I, I would, you could go about it that way and just exploit your strengths, keep on lifting and maintain that, uh, more muscular body composition. I read this question as what would I do to become an endurance athlete again, shift the, the, the scales back toward this, because as we've talked about numerous times, you can't have both. I mean, you can, but you would be uh, a true natural phenomenon. So, I mean, someone marks size at 210 pounds, if you want a five watt per kilo, you know, if you want to actually be in there with the climbings, m magically, you're going to have to have a nearly a 480 watt threshold. So you would have to be a, a special sort so of creature. Amazing. And even then, if you got numbers like that, why not shave five kilos and become a, a true world-class climber. So first off, this question was 
framed as how to regain quick uh, fitness quickly. And let's be clear, it's not going to be a quick process. Not for someone who's 10 years down the road of <laughs> heavy strength training and, and no aerobic work. It's not going to happen quickly. It'll, for it'll happen more quickly Nate's for probably, Nate. So. <laughs> Nate's not too far out from it. This guy's 10 years distant. So, so it's going to be more of a process than it will be for Nate. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still going to be a, a decently long road for Nate too, because you know, a year off that aerobic capacity, that doesn't do good things. It doesn't doesn't increase. Doesn't hold its place either. <laughs> it it drops like a stone. And I <laughs> expect that's what's going to happen in Mark's case too. So, you know, depending on time, it, it's going to be first establishing some level of consistency, getting yourself on the bike two, three, four, five days a week, depending on just how much uh, uh, emphasis you want to place on your endurance performance. And then plugging away. You know, if you've got the time, you can go the long, slow distance route. If you don't, and most of us don't, then Sweet Spot would be a great way to go, especially for an athlete who's got this massive anaerobic capacity because he can start to shape some of that anaerobic. He's probably going to have some crazy impressive shorter duration numbers, and he can start to shape some of that, shape some of those muscle fibers, the the, the adaptations within those muscle fibers, whatever, to be an increasingly aerobic athlete and probably still retain quite a lot of that anaerobic capacity. Uh, depending on how he goes about it, but it's going to be a fairly long road. And more than anything, it's going to be consistency above all. And if your concern is aerobic performance, then it's going to be consistency in your aerobic workouts. And that doesn't just mean long, slow distance or, and, or sweet spot. It can also include plenty of VO2 max, but it can't be super heavy on the VO2 max side. If you're already kind of predisposed to pushing those high glycolytic efforts. You're buzzkill, Chad. (laughs) <laughs> no, man. Hey, I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat. I haven't been doing any endurance training for a couple of months, so I'm going to have a little longer road back. And actually, oh. that would be my piece of advice for anyone who's considering a hiatus is to maintain just a little bit of something, whether it's yeah. going out on a weekend ride or if you're riding two days a week, make one of those days a uh, short VO2 max work it, workout. It can be 30 30s. It doesn't have to be this horrible three, four minute VO2 max efforts done such that you're just dreading the day as soon as you wake up, knowing that that <laughs> lies in wait, lies in wait. But uh, if if you have the opportunity to maintain any level of intensity consistency, let's call it that, then absolutely do so because then you won't have to rebuild from scratch. I almost thought that like Chad was building up a case to challenge Nate again to an event where he was like kind of knocking him down a few steps. To- no, Ooh. Not. You let's know, do it. Let's go. do one minute power. <laughs> so on train road. Road again. Let's do one minute no. power on train road. What, what day should we, should we have the test? No, uh, those are my <laughs> least favorite one efforts. efforts. One minute efforts are my That's least why we should favorite do efforts. <laughs> Chad, you got to challenge yourself. Like, uh, to, to, to what end? To, don't flight. Do the fight, Chad. <laughs> Inspire oh people. We yeah. can do a Watt KG to see who has the highest one minute Watt KG and the, and the raw. Cause yeah, who cares about it? A yeah, 60 maybe. minute walk KG, right? One this minute. is mildly Sounds interesting. Like Once I get back on the bike, then maybe I'll, I'll <laughs> my, my motivation will We could do one rekindle. minute. I, yeah. I, oh, I, such a I keep thinking effort. like I want it. I'm like my, my, I don't know if everyone else, my limiter right now is my bike is like has two flat tires. The chain's not there. My <laughs> handlebars aren't on and I don't have a trainer at my house. And I'm like, that sounds like a lot of work. Um, I think I should just ask an employee to come over and do all this for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that everyone doesn't have uh, empl- like back mechanics as employees, but uh, Chad, 30 minute workouts, we could, it'd be a fun thing to do. It's um, kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it wouldn't be a bad thing to have uh, good one minute power and to have a reason to get back on the bike multiple times. Although I, mm-hmm. I have a, a, a gravel season shaping up. So I would love got it some if, motivation um, in the, in the Chad, wings. we could, we could invite other people to challenge us too on the, on the forum to see what else they, yeah, they could do for fun. the best one minute power. That's it's, yeah. it's, I had never actually done this sounds weird, but I had never actually done like an all out hard one minute effort because in a lot of races, it tends to be longer or shorter than 60 seconds. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I did 620 Watts, uh, this year for, and that's average power for a minute. Whoa. Um, Related to body weight. What is it? What's, uh, what's the watch for that? Uh, oh man. That's high. See. Cause that's, so, yeah, that's going to be, that's so 68 kilograms, that's 68 kilograms, 620 so, sorry, no y'all. Much. This is fantastic podcast content right here. Um, <laughs> I, no, I'm looking so at mine too. Although I don't know if I should say it. Oh, uh, Ivy, is yours relatively high? Do you think for for like other racers that you go up against? I don't. Uh, maybe I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't think so. I think my strength yeah. as a writer comes from repeatability. 
and yeah. less in like raw power. But I think my one main power is not bad. Yeah. My, so mm. mine's 9.1 watts per kilogram for a minute. What's yours, Which, Abby? Have you done it? I mean, don't do the math now if you haven't done it, but I'm, I'm curious if you have it handy. For for Ivy, you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be I'm interested sorry. to see. I've never Take actually done a there. one minute all out like. Yeah. Well, see, let's, like let's talk about that because it's, Dude, it's a it, journey. If you've done, <laughs> I know it, it is because if you do a 30 like, second all out effort, you hit that 20 second mark and that last 10 seconds takes an eternity. And, and I, I found that with minute efforts that you hit like 40, maybe 45 seconds if you're lucky oh, and then just struggle so dearly to, to, to hang on for that last 15 seconds. I mean, yeah. obviously it can be paced better than I typically pace them, but this obviously. is not an effort. <laughs> yeah, but the effort, you have to pretty much be all about it from second one. It's not oh, a long yeah. effort. Yeah, right. you, you go some, all in the whole time, you know, like that. Yeah. Some I more rules. Go ahead. Go ahead, Abby. Uh, it happened, uh, uh, career time high happened this year in August training. It was 484 watts for one minute. Ooh. And uh, I lost a little bit of weight accidentally. I weigh like 135 going into the season. So that's like 61 and a half kilograms about. That's close. That's, that's okay. really close. So what oh, was yeah, that pencil that's... to? What's, what's the watts per kg? 494. Is John's 9.1? Uh, yep. 8.1. Yeah. <clears throat> that's, <got> strong. <clears throat> that's strong. That's really mm -hmm. strong. Yeah. So anyways, so you, yeah. If we're going to do this, you're rider on a one minute effort. That's Chad, what crazy. elevation do you live at right now? It's not very high. I think it's like 2,000 feet. Okay, Ooh, so what we have to do, there. if anyone wants to do this, go on the forum and motivate us. Because we want to do it. <laughs> I can tell Chad does just by looking at his face. And what we can do is uh, I don't do agree elevation. With that by looking at his face. <laughs> uh, looking at my stuff, all of my top is like at sea level. And the uh, what we want to do is do elevation adjusted based on that chart we published before. So we'll do an offset to see what it is. Because or else it's it's not yeah. very fair. Because you can Fair's get like five, six, seven percent more at sea level mm -hmm. compared to Reno. And the time yeah. frame has to be a little bit because. It's not all like a one minute power, Chad. This is a good point. It's not all anaerobic, no, right? It is no. a lot of VO2 max. And no, if your FTP is 200, there's no chance I'm going to hit old numbers of uh, when I was at like 360 because probably 360 will be my one minute power. Uh, so I just need to be able to get back up on it. Uh, so it's I don't know what the time enough. frame would be. It's probably like a two year time frame. <laughs> two years, yeah. No, <laughs> not two years. But <laughs> just because we are birthdays, about Chad. It. February? I like that. Uh, February time frame month gives away, you some time. November, December, January. Yeah. That's pretty good. I like it. Yeah. It's also crazy how Go fast ahead. your 30 second power falls, like your 30 second to your one minute power. And when I said it's a journey, it's like you can feel yourself draining all the various tanks that you use in a one minute effort. Like Nate said, like creatine phosphate, that match yep. burns real quick. It's yeah, gone. totally. Because <laughs> like, so that person doesn't hurt. hurt. You're like, this yeah. is easy. <laughs> yeah. And then you go to like anaerobic stores and after like 20, 30 seconds, you're like, those are gone. And now I'm starting to die. And then you have to make it stretch for twice what you've already done. It's yeah. really, really hard. And then you start what? like, am I breathing wrong? Is this what's <laughs> <laughs> in the nose? My FTP <laughs> is wrong. Help. Yeah. Love you, Craig. Yeah. When people yeah. jokingly talk about having a bucket ready, this is an effort where you legit need 100%. to have a bucket ready. Yeah. Yep. I, oh, wait, that, that was, I had to, I had to unclip after mine. I unclipped and sat down. I did the oh. cross country. I did like the cross country skier starfish, you know, yeah. it was rough. <laughs> Can we talk about yeah. Mark again for a second to wrap it up? Please. Oh, yeah. I just, just Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mark. I do love when we have podcast episodes where it feels like this is what it would be like to get a beer with you guys. So yeah. it's yeah, so, it's so fun. This is absolutely yeah. what we would talk about. Uh, but yeah, Mark uh, is in a spawn life where he has more free time, uh, wants to get back in road racing. I just want to point out this mindset for people that are coming back from a hiatus or whether it's 10 years or illness, where they wait for a moment to be ready when they think that they are done being fit or done getting back to where they should be in order to get into a bike race. And I, that's such a horrible mentality to get into. You have to apply this approach of you can race during this build process. And, you know, the whole thing is a process that you should enjoy. There's no end point at which you're ready and you should allow yourself to go race again. It's okay to be bad at bike racing and not be where you want to be while you're getting fit and regaining fitness, you know? Yeah, just put your ego on a shelf. It's not going to, it's, it's not going to 
bolster your self-confidence for, for a little while, but it is what it is. You have to recognize I'm not coming from a place of high aerobic fitness. This will not be super impressive just yet. Ivy's words are a little harsh. Horrible bike racer, a horrible mentality, and a bad bike racer. <laughs> Ivy should be a coach. You're horrible. Um, but think of it this way. In these races, because your fitness is going to come back relatively quicker, people are going to be like, oh, that person uh, gets dropped. They're no threat. Look at them. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And then once you make your move later, oh, they're yeah. not going to chase you. So yep. it's a whole, it's a, it's a strategy, right? <laughs> that they think that you're bad. And then you're going to, you're just going to shoot right past them. Uh, yeah. It's like you're in a slingshot. You're going to go in the draft and whoosh, and they're going to be like, oh, no, I can't do it. And and you're going to learn along the way. Like, you know, Chad said, put your ego on the shelf and I guess put your learning cap on Mm. in the sense that Mm. like this is, you get to, when you race fitness constrained, you learn a ton. Ivy mentioned the fact that she's, uh, she came into this cross season sick and it was not ideal, but you approached it with this growth mindset that you're like, Hey, I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to pick up things and get you and kind of get back into the swing of things again with cross racing. Cause it takes such a big hiatus. And then by the time my fitness is coming around, I'll have a whole lot of those cobwebs blown out. And as a result, I'm can confidently say I'm better at steering and better at pacing strategy during races than I ever have been before, because I didn't come in with it with a bunch of fitness and couldn't just dumb pedal my way out of any situation. <laughs> so, so you started strength. off, you were horrible. No, you're, you're a bad, you're a bad. Did I racer. say that? I did not say that. Mindset. You did not I say wanna, that. I, I want to replay. It's, it's uh, recorded. <laughs> <laughs> we know what you meant, Ivy. I want to cover a yeah. couple of things. So let's just say you're trying to regain fitness quickly. Let's say that you've been sick recently. Uh, the, the key with coming back from illness is not to rush it. We've talked about this, uh, you know, at length on the podcast you're going to actually, let's just say that by the end of the month is you have a race, you're probably going to be further ahead. If you give yourself those extra few days to rest and recover Mm -hmm. than trying to rush in too soon, that just prolongs your recovery process and stunts your, your growth uh, to come back to it. So give yourself time. That's a really important thing. It's really tough for us to do. We've talked about that before, like wait until you think you can come back and give yourself a day for illness give yourself two or three days maybe after that so that you can really be in a spot where your body's ready to absorb training stress and turn it into gains because that's a a hard process for it to do. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is if you are coming back and you have uh, like previously high levels of fitness, uh, somewhat recently, like maybe you're just taking a three month break or something like that. You can get, this is where like sweet spot training in particular, like Nate mentioned, shines like you can work higher within that aerobic zone rather than just lower with long hours. And you can get a whole lot for a little bit of of time. Now that doesn't mean that you can just go do like, if you know, you would do otherwise 10 hours of low aerobic work that you can suddenly do 10 hours of sweet spot work and everything will be good. You have to keep in mind what you can actually absorb. And that's pretty tough. But, uh, so you have to make sure uh, that you're balancing that. Right. But the other thing I swear, I think, uh, we always, we as athletes, fixate on the training being the thing that we need to focus on most. Whereas if the training is laid out for us in a solid training plan, we don't have to fixate on that as much. Instead, if you really want to get back to fitness quickly, focusing on recovery and focusing on good nutrition in parallel with your training is going to really help fast track your way to coming back. You know, maybe instead of getting your typical seven hours of sleep, you make it a goal to get eight to nine hours of sleep. Uh, maybe instead of, you know, falling into, uh, to nutrition patterns and everything else that have you not eating a lot of variety, you aim for variety and color, right? So like, and you just change it up in that regard. Uh, those sort of things just enable your body to do a whole lot more. So if you're in a situation, whether it's illness or whether you're just coming back from a hiatus, cause it's a lot of folks right now, those are the tips that I would give, um, trust in the plan and then enable yourself to do everything you can with it. Okay. Ben's question. Uh, Ben says, I live in the snowy Midwest and I'm preparing for a hot and humid Ironman Cozumel in two weeks. I actually think that that's maybe this weekend or no, it's like, it might be this weekend. It's coming up soon. What are your best tips on lowering core body temperature mid ride and run? And are those tips something that should be applied under normal circumstances too? It's a good question. I also have like some UCI stuff I want to get into a little later on this, but, uh, Chad, Nate, uh, which one yeah. of you wants to start with this one? I mean, the, like, a an ice slushy, like research wise is the the best thing. And you can kind of like try to drink and swallow that stuff to cool you off. Uh, but in a, in these rides, you probably don't have access to an ice slushy. So the, like on the run, 
Um, uh, obviously, you know, people put it in their hat. I don't like running with a hat because I feel like it keeps heat in, but I dump water on my head. Um, I cover my body. Um, I get my groin area too on the run. And then if I can, I will, there's a lot of, um, blood, um, vessels. I don't remember saying this right, but basically in your hands and I put cold things in my hands too and run with that until they're hot. And then I drop them or I put them in a run. You'll probably want to put them in your pocket until you get to the next aid station and then drop them. But those things can, uh, really help. And there's a Chad, correct me if I'm wrong. There's a lot of research showing that cooling off at your hands helps you lower your core body temperatures. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it has to do a lot with <clears throat> with the axillary regions, with the fingertips, the hands, the feet. It's pretty hard to cool your feet, unfortunately, although that'd be uh, ripe territory for the next cooling uh, mm -hmm. magic, ma mag magic pill. Um, but the, I think anywhere where there's microvasculature, where there's heat exchange within the blood, that, that those are prime areas. And there have been uh, – the study that I know you're talking about where they submerge their hands in ice water. And for a little while, there was a, a glove being developed. I think we've talked about this before that, that cooled the hands during a workout. And all this was in a strength training context. But these were pretty metabolic strength scenarios. So they, they were generating a heck of a lot of body heat. And then I even started to employ this in my garage for a while, the one – Nate. Uh, Nate's garage now, where just during really hot days and you'd wind yourself up in terms of temperature, doing whatever exercise you were doing, breathing's all ramped up, core temperatures climbing, hands in the ice water, and it had an incredibly surprising impact. But and this was based on research that Nate and I had both read, so it wasn't just a a, a lucky guess. Guess what, Chad? Hmm. I put a AC unit in the garage, oh, game changer, because that garage Ooh. in the summer gets mm -hmm. like. 90, 95. Uh, yeah, that is, hot. yeah, that is did huge. You do a, did you do a Mr. Cool, uh, sort of a thing, Nate, like the, the, the mini split unit? I got a mini split. Yes, correct. Which yep. is it's so expensive, but I was like over 10 years and the amount of time that I get to train in that place rather than leave and go someplace mm -hmm. else. And oh, yeah. I didn't want it inside my house. It was worth it for me. I invested in that too for my training space and it's an absolute game changer. And I also positioned it. So it directly blows on me. <laughs> like the, they're like, it seems like a weird spot to put your mini split. And I'm like, yeah, don't worry about it. That's like, you know, uh, that's where I'll be. <laughs> I want to talk on the bike now. Uh, so in an Ironman, you have an aero helmet and Cozumel lucky. It's going to be hot, but there'll be, it'll be windy. You get a lot of evaporative cooling and there is no, um, there's no climbs. It's an extremely flat course, but I've had it on a climb in an Ironman. You have the aero helmet on. And mm -hmm. you just start mm -hmm. to like bake and I'm going to try to like squeeze it in the cracks of like the helmet because a lot of them, or there'll be two vents or something. I try to put water in there, um, but you just can't get it in and you can almost start to panic because you, your, your face gets so hot with the shield on or sunglasses and you know, everything on there. So if you do you have a lot of climbs and it's hot, try to get some kind of vented arrow helmet or at least some kind of practice so that, you know, um, are you going to, it's hard though if you're in the Midwest too. If you're gonna you're gonna die on this, just know I don't know I don't know what to do. There's no <laughs> so you're, you're gonna you're die on this. You're gonna, you're gonna die. Uh, <laughs> but no, other you than will that, not like, bed. You'll be okay. During the bike at the aid stations, if you can, it's really hard to do though. If you get an extra bottle of water, and I just spray it like on my back, I've done. Or have you guys ever done it too, where you take the top off and you just dump the whole thing on you? I've totally mm -hmm. done in bike races. You just and try to hit your face rather than your helmet. If you hit your helmet, it's like a, you're wearing an umbrella and it just goes <laughs> off everywhere yeah. and you don't get hit and it's very annoying. But if you pour it um, like at the base of your neck and go down and cover your body, uh, yeah. that's on the bike. Other than that, I don't really do anything else. Yeah. What about you guys? Ivy, during your time, like racing like Tour Down Under, which is a famously super hot race, what did you do to cool yourself off? Um, evaporative cooling was for sure, I mean – from a sensation standpoint, feels more effective than just like the cold thing itself, like an ice sock. The actual point of an ice sock uh, cooling this one spot on your back doesn't cool you as effectively as all of the water that's running off of it. Um, evaporative mm -hmm. cooling is so much more important. And so like going back to the cars and getting bottles and more ice, um, I've seen riders with their short finger gloves. Like there's a lot to be said for fabrics that are intended to cool that help in the evaporative cooling process more so than if it's just dumping water on your skin that doesn't hold. Um, and so I've seen riders spray water on the back of their gloves to put some moisture there, um, to help with evaporative cooling. And I know that a lot of, um, like Keegan and, uh, Russell, I think ride with uh -huh. those, um, sun sleeves. That's right. To help in that regard too. Um, doesn't mean don't, and we're listening, don't go train in the summer with your 
thermal arm warmers and get them wet because you think that that's the same effect. It's not. Just like <laughs> wet suit material. Yeah. <laughs> but it's holding water. It's cooling yeah. me down. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, so this is, um, I really would like to see, and, and on it. So my tips, Ben, for cooling off, uh, like Chad said, the axillary region. So we're talking armpits, groin, anything where you've got like a, a, a fold of the skin that's really going to actually, you know, vent quite a lot <clears throat> and keeping your hands cool, everything else. Uh, your stomach, you vent a huge amount of heat from your stomach, uh, up from your groin up to like your navel <clears throat> and then also around your neck and everything else. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so that can be really tough, uh, if you can't get access to that. And with aid stations, like on the bike, you probably won't be able to access that on the run is where you're going to have to cool off quite a lot. So I absolutely think that it's a smarter choice for most, like look like most age group triathletes are not fighting for like a 0.19 CDA, right? They're hitting somewhere above that. And they've probably got a lot of other things that are affecting their CDA adversely. And in many cases, if you haven't done testing with your aero helmet, like your TT helmet, it might not actually be faster than just using an aero road helmet because of the profile of the helmet and how you hold your head in relation to your body, it might actually be slower. So just cause the helmet is fast, it's really, the helmet needs to be worn in a specific way to be fast. So like Nate suggested, I would absolutely recommend going with a aero road helmet that's vented, uh, something that you can, that gets a ton of air moving over your head. Uh, is if this is, as long as you can, you know, make sure you get some sunscreen on there. This is a great opportunity also to, to look at cutting your hair, uh, getting it shorter, Ben, in this case. So then if you have, you know, amazing flowing locks like Pete or something, that's going to trap a whole <laughs> lot of heat when you're on the bike. Uh, so you might want to look into that, uh, in mountain biking, I always take my, so I usually take two bottles in a feeds in a feed zone. I grab one bottle and I drink that down and that's got a bunch of carbs in it. My next bottle is my pour bottle and that pour bottle, I end up spraying almost every time on the back of my neck. So it trickles down my back on my groin and on my thighs a little bit. And then after that, I'll spray it on my hands and then, then I drop the bottle. So those can be really helpful things. What I want to talk about is <clears throat> why aren't we making extensions, aero extensions that are refrigerated? Like, I know that seems crazy, but it probably actually, who cares if you're adding a lot of weight? to a, to a bike that's racing in Cozumel, for example. And I bet it wouldn't add a huge amount of weight. And if you were just like grabbing it. onto something that's icy when you're riding, that would be super beneficial. You know, like um, a compressor unit on your bike. <laughs> like <laughs> no, like the, there's, there's ways to do this. Like, um, I have, it, it could it'd be interesting to see. And on, on that note for road racing, I feel like we had this, this power revolution where everybody started racing with power. Then we had the recovery kind of like a uh, generation where everyone was looking at like team sky was carrying around everyone's mattresses, uh, from hotel to hotel. And then we've had like the nutrition kind of era of optimization. And I, I really do think that there's a lot of room for cooling and I don't know why, unless there's UCI rules against this, <clears throat> that you aren't grabbing little ice packs in your musettes in the middle of a road race, why the pros aren't doing that. And and using those ice picks that are like, or ice packs that are designed as like gloves that just go over your hands and then cool everything off, maybe onto your arms, anything like that. But I think there's a huge amount for that in a special needs bag. I don't think that you can guarantee that anything's going to be cold in there if you put it in cold. So you're probably stuck there. But, um, if you watch what a lot of the triathletes will do too, is they'll, they won't just unzip their tri suit all on the run. They'll keep that tri suit zipped as a holder for objects that could drip water down, like Ivy was saying. So if they don't have ice socks, they're going to grab towels or sponges or something, or just dump ice into that and then zip up their jersey so it stays in there and it cools them off. Um, that's a really like a common tactic. If you look at especially a race like Kona or Cozumel, you look at all like the race photos of the top finishers at the end, and it looks like they're like uh, filling their kit with a bunch of random things, and it's because they're just trying to stay cool. So I'd try to, I'd try to stuff everything that you can that's cold in that skin suit. Um, and make sure that you're dumping water on yourself at every single aid station. Just never miss an opportunity to do that. If it's walking that aid station and taking an extra 15, 20 seconds in that aid station, it's likely going to help you more than hurt you for sure. So, uh, cool. Blake's question. I'm a huge fan of the podcast and a huge fan of all of you. Uh, actually, should we move into trivia first? Let's do trivia let's do and it. let's get into it. Yeah. Then let's get into this question. 
All right. Oh, Are you guys gosh. ready? Oh, God. <laughs> Everybody playing at home, this is Ask a Cycling Coach podcast trivia, where we get to uh, test the knowledge of all of you, but also of the hosts. So uh, the first question, which of these host favorite gas station foods has the most carbs per, per serving? Sour Patch Kids, Snickers, or 7-Eleven Corn Dog? It's got to be Sour Patch Kids. Chad says Sour Patch Kids. Corn Dog. Nate says Corn Dog. <laughs> Corn dog. Ivy. Corn dog. Nobody got it right. Uh, the answer is Snickers. <clears throat> so, so you picked this one for me and I still got it wrong. I, hate I was trying to think of serving of size and I was like, a corn dog would have a like dedicated serving size and that's why it would be there. Where uh -huh. but they, they do in America, they they'll change the serving size. So they'll have like a packet, they'll have like a candy bar, they'll be like, that's two and a half servings though. You should eat them yeah. over two and a half times, which does not happen. <laughs> this is true. This is why I limited it to serving size. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise it gets complicated. So the fact behind this, only one gram behind at 27 grams. So Snickers is 28 grams of carbohydrate. But the beloved Sour Patch Kids, they hold up much better in terms of macros with zero grams of fat and protein. So if you do need something and you're at a, at a gas station, oh, it's basically gram. just like, it's basically Martin gel. So, okay. You know. Well, the reason that I'm right anyways, is because if I were getting a gas station corn dog, I would get two. So I still chose correctly. And I get the I jumbo like corn dog. So like that's a thought you're talking about. That sounds yeah. so gross. Yeah. <laughs> Costco corn dog. All right. This one, I'm just going to have you guys type in the answers, uh, at first or think about them and then we'll reveal them. Next question. What popular adult cyclocross category has a USAC national championship USA cycling, but not a UCI world championship. <clears throat> I shouldn't have had you type it but, in. I kind of ruined yeah, it. Just, <laughs> I'm done. I'm going to, I'm going to say right, single, it was, speed. It was a quick single speed, <laughs> single speed. Yeah. Uh, they get it? it. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. Ivy. Yeah. That one was for you, Ivy. Um, unfortunately everybody else got it too. So it's nullified, but <laughs> known for its counterculture tendencies and irreverent vibe, single speed world championships is held in the USA every autumn and the winners have to receive a mandatory tattoo signifying their victory. <clears throat> so <laughs> Have it's, to. Uh, it's, you know, it's true. It's a it also rolls down. <laughs> yeah, rolls down. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. Uh -huh. This next one, hold the answers private and then we will <clears throat> reveal them all at once. Okay. Next question. What type of animal is the mascot of the Tour de France's yellow jersey sponsor? Hold it. Hold it silent. I know. All right. Everyone? Lion. <laughs> a lion. Yeah. lion. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone got it. Nice. Good. Good. This is also kind of like whose line is it anyway? Cause I'm not keeping track of points. So the points are made <laughs> up and you know, whatever else. Um, all right. Next question. Chad's going to know this one. I'm throwing a bone to Chad from what was one of the most exciting finishes in cycling history. What was Matthew Vanderpool's average power during the 2019 Amstel gold closest guest wins? Uh, Although 360. I yeah. I don't know. I'm going to say 380. Okay. Three. I think it was wait. Three. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go the price is right. Really high though. He's he's wavy. Three eighty one. <laughs> Three eighty one. I think we're both. Ivy, over. you didn't learn from prices right the last time. No, none of you guys are the closest one to it was Nate at 360 watts. 330? No, his uh his power, let me scroll down to it. His power was actually 278 watts. Well, Doesn't seem what? that high, right? But it's normal. Oh, I mean average normalized is probably 360. Average yeah. power. Average power. And yeah, no, his normalized average. was only at that one. I believe that his normalized was only 290 or 300 Watts. Quite low. Yeah, it was a long day though. Yeah. Yep. Long day. Yep. Yeah. Quite like low. Was, mm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> For what we expect. But that was absolutely one of the most exciting finishes that we've seen. And that was the one where he came back and he led the entire, he led the chase for the final <clears throat> 10 miles, brought back the field, found himself on the front with 800 meters to go, looked around and then just let out his own sprint and nobody could catch him. It was one of the coolest races I've ever seen. It's pretty sweet. Okay. This next one in the popular 15 seconds on 15 seconds off anaerobic workout, Spanish needle on trainer road. How many work intervals are in each set? 20. Thanks, 15. You're, and I, I'm going to give you guys, actually, forgive me, I, I forgot to copy in the multiple choice. 16, uh, B, 19, or C, 20? I'm going to say B. 20. 19. It's, not a, it's 20 or I, 16, but it's, I'm going to say 20. C, 20. 
See, that's C. The answer is A, 16. Ah, <laughs> I hate it. feels this. like 20, I though. Hate so I hate really this. <laughs> it does feel like 20. Right. Fair point. All right. Last <laughs> trivia question. This one Chad's absolutely going to get, but I'm not so confident on. When you say that. We'll see. God. Yeah, it's true. What is the highest point every year in the Giro d'Italia called? Uh, no, I'm totally blanking. Oh, the no, top Chad, of the you mountain. got this. Oh, the Angler route? Or are we talking the <laughs> highest point? <laughs> I don't know. The highest point. If you know the answer, that's sufficient. I do not know the answer. Did we stump everyone on this one? Yeah. You did. The answer is the Chima copy. Oh, you mean now the, oh, Chad's going to. See what you're now saying. Now Chad's going <laughs> to. Oh, yes. I yeah, knew that so, too. So from, from <laughs> zero to zero, what's the highest point? No, that's Indeed. True. Indeed. Yep. The Chima Copy was first introduced in 1965, Giro d'Italia, in honor of the late Fausto Copy, who won five editions of the Giro, three mountain classifications during his career. So they named it after him. Special point. All right. That's the that's the trivia. If you played at home, how'd you do? I think that our winner here on this one is Nate. <laughs> I think no, it's Chad. Nate, I think it's Chad. I don't think so. Can you guys <laughs> just tell that I really love bar trivia? I just thrive in the trivia setting. I love I think, it. I think the key with bar trivia is you're typically a bit drunk. It makes it a heck of a lot easier. Slow your roll, not blurt out stupid answers. <laughs> Chad, you could have, you know, you could have brought something in. Yeah, I was going to say Chad. <laughs> I, I tried to build this up into an interactive format for all the listeners so that they could like uh, participate via Google form. Uh, I got to work on that, but that could be a fun thing. If you like trivia, if you like this little intermission that we have and you enjoy it, let us know. Uh, we got really positive feedback on it last time, but let us know if you want to see more of it and we'll do it occasionally on the podcast. All right, Blake's question. <clears throat> I'm a huge fan of the podcast and a huge fan of all of you. <clears throat> so glad I found you all about a year ago. Here's my question, and it's actually two. Why do I feel like rubbish during taper week <clears throat> before every race, and do other cyclists have this experience? Every time I taper, my stomach gets funky, my breathing gets weird, meaning I feel short of, I feel short of breath, my muscles get stiff and my joints get achy. I feel this way because the or basically the whole taper week. Looking online, it sounds like runners experience this, but what about cyclists and what's the cause? The runners seem to think they are actually getting sick every time they taper, but I don't yeah. think I'm actually getting sick because I feel great during the race every time. Seems doubtful that I'm miraculously healing exactly on race day every time I race. <laughs> they call Nate. it taper flu for runners. And the, the, the thought is, I don't know if there's any science to back this up, but the conventional wisdom is you like suppressed your immune system that whole time. And then you had something in there. And then when you can actually recover, you have those symptoms. I don't think that's true, but, um, yeah, that's what they call taper flu. Yeah. yeah. Or taper tantrum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like no, that. serious. Uh, yeah. Of course. What I really want to know is how can I taper without feeling like junk every time? But I know that you already figured that part out from the question. So again, thanks so much for the podcast. It's incredible. And you're all just awesome. Now there's a lot of additional information and I think that it adds a lot of key insight to this. So I'm actually going to read it this time. Blake says, here's some background info that may be helpful that you can read out loud on the podcast. If you decide to cover my question, in addition to significantly reducing my physical workload, when I taper, get ready for the red flag. I also significantly reduce my calorie intake. I burn about 1000 fewer calories per day during a taper week than during the training weeks leading up to the taper. And I try to reduce my calorie intake by about 1000 calories per day too during taper week. I think I'm getting this about right because I neither gain nor lose weight during the taper week. My normal diet has a lot of sodium in it. I'm a salty sweater. So I think that makes sense when I'm training, but I haven't made any effort to significantly reduce my sodium intake while tapering per calorie of food. It's about the same. And finally, also, I am a pretty heavy sweater, not just a lot of salt in my sweat, but a lot of sweat itself. I consume about as much water during my taper week as I do during my training weeks, not counting the water I consume on the bike. But of course, I'm not sweating much during taper week. Not sure if any of that's relevant, uh, but if I'm not actually getting sick, my best guess is it has something to do with my diet during taper week. That 1,000 calorie deficit during taper week is a big red flag to me. Ivy, you're yeah, shaking imagine, your head too. Yeah, thinking they feel great uh, racing after that taper week with, with their approach now, imagine how much better they feel they'll feel if they eat more food. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the reason most people feel this way or just not great during taper week is because your body's recouping from what you've just put it through. You've given it a chance to, I mean, it's still working. Um, just because you're not training and doing work on the bike or in running doesn't mean your body is not still working. And if you don't meet the demands from a nutrition standpoint, it's going to feel even worse. Um, 
just because you're not burning calories in the same way as while you're training doesn't mean your body's not still being taxed and you still need to nourish it. So um, this one seems pretty simple. Eat more food, however good you feel on race day, you'll feel even better. I think you'd want to gain a little bit of weight too, because you're going to be storing glycogen and that's like, you want to replenish that during that taper week. That's one of the the benefits of it. Uh, I think too, the, the amount of weight you would gain in one week of actual like body fat, uh, like Chad, that would be very hard to do something that's going to like, you have to eat so much more to actually gain something that's meaningful. The more important part is like Ivy said is to have your legs feel good. Like have your body feel good and then be able to have all that glycogen when you go into the race. And sadly, it's never as tidy as if I burn a thousand calories on the bike, I burned a thousand calories of sinning. Or if I, <laughs> it, it just doesn't, it doesn't translate like that. So anytime you try to make the math that simple and straightforward, you have to recognize that we're a biological system and it's never that simple. So for example, if you do burn a thousand calories in a workout, that's not to say you have to eat a thousand calories or if you are eating a thousand calories, that that all the work's being fueled by the incoming thousand calories. So some of it's being fueled by onboard fuel stores, whether it's onboard sugar or onboard fat. But for for example, if these thousand calories, only seven hundred of them are being dedicated to the actual work you're doing, the other three hundred are being pushed to other bodily systems, and now you're denying that additional three hundred calories for systems that still need those calories because you just tied it to that simple. I burned a thousand calories, so I don't need a thousand calories. Just again, it, do, it, it doesn't work out that tidily. So if for that reason alone, but also the reasons of replenishing glycogen stores, of fueling the healing or adaptation process, et cetera, I would start with your nutrition. I mean, if, if on day one, and this was my initial response, if on day one you're feeling terrible, well, you should be. I mean, anytime we finish a loading cycle, just think a three-week loading cycle heading into a recovery phase or a recovery week or a recovery couple of days, no one feels good. I mean, not typically. If you push yourself hard for week one into week two into week three, you're carrying a lot of fatigue. You've built up, I mean, the you, you have a strong basis for requiring some off time. Your body needs to regenerate in, in a number of ways. So it makes sense that at least over the first couple of days, you would feel pretty rubbish, as you put it. And, and to feel that way over the whole week, and then just in time for your event to feel great, I, I have a hard time criticizing that. I mean, that, that's, that's a bummer that that week doesn't feel better. But if you rally just in time for your most important event and perform well on that event, I wouldn't uh, dissect this too much. Yeah, this is a great point. Like it takes time for fatigue to shed, right? It builds up and it's residual. And what your body is doing when it's shedding from that, if you're doing a taper week, right, you're nourishing properly, recovering properly. When it's shedding that fatigue, it's also making adaptation to making you better. Um, so this is, <clears throat> it's all part of the process, you know? Chat, and I did sorry. see a couple of things that got a bit more physiological in nature. The the idea that if uh, he mentioned hydration and that he's maintaining his same hydration or they are maintaining their same hydration regimen that maybe there's an increase in blood plasma and that can have an impact on your hematocrit and that could stimulate the kidneys to produce more EPO, which could change red blood cells. I mean, there, eh, there are maybe physiological systems or physiologic goings on that we're not crediting that might have a small part of this, but I don't think any one of them is going to be, uh, that's the thing. You just need to drink more, drink less, eat more, eat less. I do think it's a combination of having a lot of fatigue and uh, there was something else with, oh yeah, you also have to consider that there is a pretty hefty hormonal milieu that goes on with every workout, every loading week, every taper. I mean, the, the hormones are in high flux. They, they're just, mm -hmm. there, there are things that effectively get turned off or at least turned down in the case of a taper. Uh, norepinephrine springs to mind, cortisol. Uh, there, there are things that shift a bit and they may too have an impact on how you feel, especially in those days right as uh, the, the early days of the taper. That's a good point. I, I'm thinking of this, the successful athletes I know, whether professional or not, the ones that are top performers and a stark difference about how they carry out their recovery week nutrition compared to others and their recovery weeks in general is that they aim to eat just as much as they would when they are training during those recovery weeks. Um, they don't try to diet and lose weight during that week. Uh, they, they think, man, my body's doing a lot of work to get faster this week. I better give it all the fuel it can have, uh, so that it can actually make those changes. 
Yeah, and exactly to Nate's point, I don't think too much damage can be done during that week, especially if you're tapering. We're not talking about even a recovery week where you're dialing it down to low intensity work and just maintaining consistency. You're still doing a fair amount of work, maintaining intensity. Um, yeah, the volumes come way down. So maybe that leads you to think I need substantially less calories. But man, if I were to try anything first, it would probably be just to tweak my nutrition a little bit and see how I felt. Okay, Paul, how many of you have during a recovery week or a taper tried to also lose weight at the same time and had horrible outcomes? <laughs> Both hands up. Yeah. I have. Oh I mean, says hands never? Up. No, like never. Every time. <laughs> no, never. You've never done it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have, us men I have are all dumb the time. we've done it a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> and, and honestly, to this point too, Nate, and to Chad's point just now, we're really good at drawing this, this imaginary connection in our mind that like, whatever the food going in, boom, that's going to make us gain weight. Like we think like, uh, it's Halloween right now. And if you went in there and you snagged that little Snickers bar, the fun size one from your, from your kid, that that's instantly going to go toward body fat. And we build that up in our minds that there's this like directly linear cor correlation, the instant like body fat. And it doesn't work that way. And remember, it's really important to remind yourself that it's what you do chronically that defines you, not what you do occasionally. And during this week that you have this taper week, you should just be focusing on like, what can I do to give my body everything it needs? Like, uh, I mean, think about like, if you know somebody that's just gone through something really hard and traumatic, <laughs> which is kind of like training, you'd want to console them and help them like, like give them everything that they need so that they can be better. And you're, you need to do the same thing for your, your body. Like you've, you've asked a lot of your body and it's done incredible things. So now this week it's time to give your body everything that it needs to be able to get better. So it's, and when you have that shift in your mindset, I feel like it really helps you go into an event, not just physically better prepared, but also mentally better prepared. You're like, Hey, I've done everything to, to get here because when you have this fear perspective of, I need to not gain weight, I need to not do this. I need to choke back during your recovery week. It puts you on kind of the back foot coming into your goal event. Whereas if you're focusing on nourishing yourself, it totally changes that. So, uh, Josh's question. Josh says, how does participate in this one's got Ivy written all over it. How does participating in a series where every race matters, which I'd question that last or that little statement that he said, um, how do you, how does participating in a series where every race matters versus training for an all in championship race change the training plan or does it? So one race versus lots of races in the series, Ivy, this is your wheelhouse. You've done both. Yeah. Because I used to try to race every single discipline all year long. And I was like, when, when are I good? I, huh? <laughs> you, you can't like, you can't peak all the time. Um, and it totally depends upon how long the series is. Um, so, you know, if it's something like a weekly crit series that goes all spring and all summer and into the early fall, um, training to peak for all of that or be good at all of that for the overall se series, isn't really a good strategy. Um, you, you just have to kind of decide what kind of rider you want to be and what will make you feel fulfilled. If you're okay being okay for the whole entire series or year, um, then that will change how you decide to train and how you use plan builder. But if you decide that you want to use that training process to still be okay, but still have a really big peak and understand that some of those earlier races, you won't be where you maybe want to be or where you know you'll be at the end. Um, you just have to decide what you're more comfortable with and what will be more fulfilling for you um, and what your goals are. If you'd rather come away, you can still be one of those riders that has a few really good results and has all in races um, and still achieve season long or series goals through that process. Um, and we see questions like this a lot when athletes ask, you know, like I'm training for a grand pondo. Um, they're both hundred miles. One has zero elevation gain, totally flat. The other one has 18,000 feet of climbing. How do I train differently for them? And it's important to acknowledge that your training approach isn't that different because the reality is you'll still be riding at a certain pretty high percentage of your FTP for that whole duration. That's the kind of fitness you're still tapping into regardless of what the course looks like. Um, and so when you're training, for a goal in a specific event, you have to keep that in mind that, um, you know, your, the, the preparation you're doing is still preparing you to be good in any of these circumstances. Um, and you have to decide, um, you know, like if I'm peaking for nationals 
at the end of the year. Um, and the fitness that I've created will set me up for success there. The races that I do before that, I'm still going to have that fitness. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing I do from, you know, I'm not going to gain any fitness from September to November. I'm just maintaining. Um, so it really depends on how long your season is. And I wonder what Josh is referring to. If it is one of those, like, basically year-long crit series or if it's a few single races. I think I, I have an I, I idea. It's just a guess, but it might be one of those series that basically rewards consistency and that it, the, all, all the races go into a, a single points pool rather than best seven of 10 and they don't drop any races. So simply by racing all of the races, because maybe that's what he means by every race matters, you get points in every single race. And I've been in those series and I've done well in those series simply by showing up, simply by having the greatest points accumulated, even though I didn't maybe even podium throughout, I still end up on the overall podium because again, I accumulated points. So that's a thought, but regardless, you can't expect to, to further Ivy's point. You can't expect to be at the top of your game over the course of a season, even, even something as short as let's take cycle cross since it's probably at the forefront of most of our minds right now, since it is what's, what's happening. Watch the best riders in the world. You watch Ilya Zerbit every year start out super strong, comes out swinging, and then kind of flags over the course of the season. And you have riders on the other end of that. And even if you look at the bigs, you know, the, the Pitcocks, the Matthew Vanderpools, the Watt Van Arts, they're not super fast all season. They take their lumps too. They definitely know how to time it. They've definitely picked the races that are most important, and they're definitely as fast as they're going to get when Worlds runs around or rolls around. But they're not. They, they're not that way all season long, not even the, over the course of a – what's cycle cross? November through February about, so maybe five months? Yeah, or September like through February, depending if you're yeah. here in the States. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, pretty lengthy. When I look at this, the most basic answer and direct answer for you, Josh, is that if you're preparing for a series, you're likely going to spend more time in, in the specialty phase of training. Uh, that may not mean that your specialty phase is drug out longer – until you have a specific event, but you might take a short break after and, and plan builder will build all this out for you. You'll get into your season and you might have one event and then you might go back into the specialty phase again as the specialty phase isn't meant to make you faster, but rather maintain and fine tune what you have. So you're likely just spend more time in the specialty phase than you would otherwise, if you are going for a whole season. Um, the one advice that everyone's kind of hinted around at that I think is really important is that Josh, even if every race matters, pick a race that you want to peak for and set that as your goal event. In most cases, it's best to do that somewhere around like what I've found for these just every week sort of series, two thirds, three quarters of the way through the series, if you can. Because if you can do that, you're going to get a lot of folks that have come in peaked and then attrition is going to be making it so that they do not perform very well. Uh, and that's going to make it so that in an overall series, you'll likely be building up while they're already peaked and starting to drop down. And then by the time you hit your peak, they might be really far down. So that's typically the advice that I would give is pick a race somewhere about, you know, two thirds, three quarters of the way through is your peak event. So you can build into that. And then that also makes it so that after that event, you can kind of stretch your fitness, you know, and, and plan builder will do that. It'll take your specialty phase. And if you have another race six weeks after or anything else, and you're still racing, it'll still do its best to maintain the fitness that you have before you you know, you can take a break. So that's my best advice, uh, for that one. Uh, I'm, I think I'm going to race our Reno Devo, our, our local junior team. They put on, uh, they put on short track races like April through Ooh. July. And I th yeah, yeah. And you just you took me on that course there. Yeah. And you just get destroyed by little, by kids. At least I do the whole time. They're really, really fast. Um, but it's like the most fun races I've, uh, I think the most fun racing I've ever done. So I'm going to be doing that this pick. year. I got a bone to pick <laughs> with junior bike racers right now. They're wrecking my life. They have living swannies, <laughs> people cooking for them. I, they don't pay taxes yet. I can't deal with it. <laughs> They're wrecking yeah. my life. All they care about is Watts. That's it. Yep. And they go out and do it. So Final question. Evan says, Hey host, I'm getting ready for my third season with trainer road and using plan builder to satisfy all of my curiosities about different plan or training plan options for different events. I'm interested in next year. That is a fun thing to do with, uh, with plan builder. If you have a bunch of different things you could do, just build out all the scenarios and check them out for fun. So I, I, I admit Evan, I'm, I'm a nerd that does the same thing. So, uh, my main question has to do with picking from your base phase plans. What circumstances would be best for picking between your traditional sweet spot and polarized base plans? What would be the difference in fitness differences in fitness gained between the three options? 
There's also a backup question is on your time off feature. Is there a recommendation for a certain amount of time I should be taking off during the year? For example, after every training phase, one week, every quarter, et cetera. So let's go into the training plan. Uh, one first, uh, Nate, can you, uh, kick this one off for us? Like what circumstances would be best for picking between the three different base plans? What say you? Yeah. So just do your event and then plan builder will choose those for you. Um, that's the information <laughs> that I have for you on, <laughs> on that. And then, uh, the, the time off, like we've talked about a lot, minimum two weeks month is also good. It's a month, probably stay active, do some other things. More time is obviously still valid, but at a very minimum two weeks. And that's probably going to, I don't know, I think two weeks, like completely off the bike. And the chat said, maybe go back, do some fun stuff, unstructured training inside of there. Uh, and when we talk about this too, it's not between training phases. This is like, if you have a block for an A event, like a season, you either have a season that you're kind of going to peak for or uh, an event. Sorry, you wouldn't speak for a season, but you're going to ride through an important season and then peak for an event. And if you're going between seasons like road versus cyclocross, it's so tempting to say, hey, I came into my road or I'm ending my road season, uh, highest fitness I've ever had. What if I continue to train even more and cyclocross, I'll be twice as fast. Um, <laughs> not twice as fast, but even faster. And like sure. Ivy, have you experienced that? Does that happen? Oh yeah. Uh, for specifically for me with carrying from cross fitness into road season, I feel like the cross season is so short and I'm like, Oh, I'm just, I'm just getting going. Like I finally feel good. Um, let me just carry this over and I'll do some early season XC stuff and, um, you know, jump into some early season road races and just absolutely fall apart uh, without taking that rest. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to go back to the, to the base, uh, like between which ones, uh, which is a tip that a lot of people don't know on train road is you can actually click on when there's a little annotation, whenever your training block begins, you can go and click on that and you can swap out between like training volume, or you can even in some cases swap out with different plans. Um, so our polarized plans are still in an experimental phase, uh, which basically means that we're still gathering data on, on what we're getting from that. So if you want to hear more about that and want to get insights from this, please follow the polarized plans, uh, with some level of adherence <laughs> so that we can get better oh. data. Um, <laughs> so then we can, so then we can compare these sort of things. Um, but you can swap out between those things in most cases. And this is why we have a built into plan builder. Uh, our sweet spot base plan is going to be the best option for most athletes. Uh, in some cases we've talked about, like if you've, uh, if you, if you've done it for a long time, you want to change in stimulus. Sure. You can do the traditional base plans. You can change it up. Uh, the polarized plans too. Um, it's really the tricky thing yeah. with Nate, go ahead. I say that the most important part of this is picking the correct volume for you that allows you yes. to be consistent over the season. And that's the, that's the thing that we see is that it's not the, you know, they'll pick high volume sweet spot base when they only do two workouts a week for the last year. And then they go into six and they go, Oh, this is too hard. These plans are too hard when really you should be in low volume with three workouts per week. Uh, that, so mm -hmm. that's the big thing, like rather than which base plan you pick is to pick the correct volume and traditional base, totally valid. You just have to have the time in order to do that. And that's a big time investment in order to do traditional base. So just be aware of that. And for some people too, myself uh, included, traditional base can be a little mind numbing to do totally. so much stuff like the first couple of times you're like, great, I'm going to watch a movie. Then you're like, oh, this timer is getting <laughs> going a lot slower. Yeah. And even outside too, it can be <laughs> numbing for me. I like the variety of, um, you know, sweet spot base, low volume. When you get into two, like it's, it's switching up. It's not all sweet spot base. It's, we have terrible marketing with the name of it. Um, cause people yeah. think that it's all sweet spot base and it is not, it's a variety of things. And, um, it really like kind of, uh, gently push it gently, relatively gently to use a term Chad did before yeah. into a uh, base <laughs> phase later on. I mean, a uh, build, build phase later on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Talking so hard guys. Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I want to <laughs> echo what Nate said. And that's a key thing. Like, uh, if you're training like for the traditional base thing, what we see with a lot of athletes is the adherence tends to be lower with that plan. And it's because a lot of athletes they are like, Oh geez, like it's a little bit more boring than I thought. It's a little harder to be able to follow that. So this is like a really key thing we talk about endlessly. The, the biggest thing that you can focus on in terms of what moves the needle and what shows the athletes improve with is training consistency. So like Nate said, you pick the training volume and the plan that allows you to be the most consistent with your training. And that's going to deliver the sort of improvements that you're seeking for when you're signing up for a plan. It's all about enabling that to happen. Ivy. 
I need to send this to every single athlete that DMs or asks me how how many watts, how much will my FTP increase if I do this plan for, or this block versus this block? It's mm-hmm. I want to send that to every single athlete that's asked me that <laughs> because it's so much more about uh, compliance um, and picking mm-hmm. a volume that's sustainable than sweet spot versus traditional. You know what's crazy well, yeah, is our go ahead, Chad. I was just going to say you can't assess or critique or criticize a training plan if you haven't followed that training plan. And I think that's why Nate's point is the most important. You have to choose a volume that allows you to follow the training plan. Because once you can do it correctly, then you can take a step back and say, this didn't provide enough of this, or this was a little heavy on this, or a little light on this. That's the only time where you can fairly (laughs) assess how effective that plan was. You have to do that plan consistently all the way through then you can make those judgments. And that, again, requires proper assessment of what you can do. You know, what volume plan can you do? And always err on the lighter side because you can, it's a lot easier to, we've talked about this a thousand times, it's a lot easier to to dial it up than to dial it back. Yeah, so so, uh, there can be talk about sweet spot based high volume and uh, it's very hard. And there's a small percentage of people who can do it and it's made for those percentage of people. But because you can't do it, to Chad's point, doesn't mean it's invalid. Or because it, I could do Matthew Vanderpool's training plan. How long would I last? And then I'd be like, <laughs> oh, it's too much. Like, this plan's uh, terrible. <laughs> this plan's terrible. They like, told me not to do it, but I did it and it's terrible. Uh, to Ivy's point too, um, we have our machine learning for AFTP detection can do it in the future and assume you did the workouts. So we can kind of try to see what the difference in FTP would be between blocks, which you would choose. But what we have right now is we assume you did it uh, to John's point. Like that is that's in order for us to, to get better at this, we'd have to look at your past compliance and try to guess what your compliance would be. Because if we just assume you did it, the high, it's we're, high volume is going to be the, the choice each yeah. time. Right. Cause like <laughs> sure. if you could just do sure. more, you're going to, you're going to do better if, um, if you can actually do it, but you have to be realistic with yourself and it's so much better to Chad said, go at a lower volume first, go for six weeks, have recovery, see how you feel. I mean, how many of us have like first two weeks seem good. Third week, you're like, Oh no. Oh no. Yeah. It's like that, like that beam. Oh no. Oh no. Yeah, exactly. Oh no. no, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then well, you start to like spiral. Yeah. When's the last time anyone, anyone listening to this, any of us have nailed a training plan? Cause I, I can't remember. I, I always fizzle out somewhere and it's typically <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and to good end, right. It, it mm-hmm. worked out. It benefited you. You raced well, but I, I, I think I make, as often as we tell people not to choose too high volume a plan, I fall into that rut quite often because I, I know what my history is. I know what I can take or what I can <laughs> withstand and adapt to at some point, but I, when you were I'm not in that position. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm not in that position when I start the training plan. You know, again, in this case, I'm coming off of at least a two month hiatus. I full well know I can't jump into a high volume sweet spot plan. So <laughs> this time I won't do it, but I've done it pretty much every, every time historically. Chad's been living his glory days and I, I was successful in sweet spot volume, uh, sweet spot, high volume, but I literally like, I don't know, maybe it was like took five times. It was horrible. Yeah. Like I'd go through just thinking that I could, and then I'd, uh, I'd dial it back. And if you get in that case, it's perfectly acceptable. This is actually not acceptable. It's advised to dial it back. I've yeah. seen also, um, some people review that our plan on YouTube and they, they feel like the third workout cause it's three days in a row. And then they just keep failing workouts over and over and over again. And I'm like, guy, like go to low volume. Like this is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. if you fail every yeah. single All workout, signs. it All is too, <laughs> yeah, it's too hard for you. Like, don't, um, don't do that. Yeah, for sure. It's okay. Right. It's, I just want to say it's, it's okay to do lower volume. And John, you've done so many successful athletes. Oh How many gosh. successful athletes are on low volume and do like national, national level yeah. or world level results? Yeah, the vast majority, actually, if you listen to that podcast, that we had a few that did high volume. It was quite rare. It was typically they were like generational athletes, like like in the sense that if you talk to them, they're like, yeah, like, you know, I ran like five, I ran five flat when I was in sixth grade. You know what I mean? Like, they're just <laughs> like, they were like, they were meant to be really fast and that's how they were able to handle it. But the vast majority do that. And this is a great, impl- a great example of talking about just because you can doesn't mean you should. Because Chad was talking about just because you have in the past doesn't mean that you can today. But there's also just because you can doesn't mean you should. 
I, every single training, and this is why we've built adaptive training to be able to adjust for this. But every single time I've embarked on a training plan, life has given me something that I have not accounted for. And it's made it difficult to follow my training plan as prescribed. Like, you, so once again, just because I theoretically can, doesn't mean that I should try, I should fill my, my plate a hundred percent. I should leave some room there. So then life can, can throw in its chaos and I can still train. I can still be consistent. It's, it's a really, it's a hard thing for us to do because we're afraid that less training is not going to make us faster. It's going to make us slower, but in almost every case, it does end up making athletes faster because once again, we're all like the perspective I just represented. We'd like to bite off more than we can chew. Ivy. I want to point out uh, so many ways in which you can customize your volume. Uh, if you can't do high volume um, or you feel like it's not working, you don't have to drop right down, drop down right away. Or if you want to do something between low and medium, we have so many tools like um, where you got alternates. If you want to be, if you want to try high volume and you feel like you're cracking a little bit and want to just step it down a little bit to see um, if you can recover and get back to high volume, you can use alternates to choose a workout that's at a shorter duration that still hits the same systems. Um, but it's just like a little bit less volume if you want. You can use, you can start at low volume and use train now to supplement your training and adaptive training will account for it in your progression levels and know what you've done outside of your training plan through train now to account for that and adapt your later workouts. Like there are a bunch of, um, all these little ways you can be between volumes to see what works for you. And then you don't have to commit to changing the volume of your plan or feeling like you have to reapply a big change to your plan and volume. You can take these baby steps to see what kind of works and see if something is sustainable long-term, or if you need to make a bigger change, train now, uh, work your alternates, all this in between stuff. Yep. Absolutely. There's a, you know, there's no secret workout. Uh, instead it's talking, it's all about consistency. So, uh, great podcast. Thanks y'all. If you're listening to this now, go to trainerroad.com, sign up, use AI FTP detection, use plan builder, have the best season yet. If you are listening to this and you're already a part of trainer road, it would mean everything to us. Cause remember we don't have investors. We don't have huge marketing budgets. If you were to share trainer road and get your friends to join trainer road, that's how we grow. And that's how we can build more features. That's how we can have more podcasts for you. That's how we can do everything. So please do that and go to trainerroadcom slash podcast and submit the questions that you have. So then we can, cause you're the lifeblood of this podcast. So we appreciate you all doing that. Whatever question you have, send it in. If you have trivia questions that you think would be good ones, throw those in and I'll uh, save them up for the next one. And we'll talk to you all next week. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Love you. Bye.